Advocates is made possible by grants from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation and Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner and Smith, Incorporated. Tonight, from the John F. Kennedy School of Government, The Advocates. From Washington, California's Governor Jerry Brown will speak in favor of a constitutional amendment to require a balanced federal budget. Here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard economist John Kenneth Galbraith will testify in opposition to that amendment. Good evening and welcome to The Advocates. I'm Michael Dukakis. Should the federal government be forced to balance its budget? Should it have to take in a dollar for every dollar it spends? And should we have a constitutional amendment to require it to do so? That's the issue we face this evening, one of the most important issues to face this nation in many, many years. Constitutional amendments under our Constitution can originate in two ways. Congress can propose an amendment to the states for ratification, and that's the course that we have taken with most current amendments. Or two-thirds of the states can call for a constitutional convention to draft an amendment which is then subject to ratification. To date, some 28 states have already passed resolutions in one form or another, calling for a constitutional amendment which would require the federal government to balance its budget. If just six more states act, two-thirds of all the states in the Union, then Congress will almost certainly be forced to act, either to propose the amendment or to call the Constitutional Convention. Tonight, we will not be debating the merits of a constitutional convention, but rather of the amendment itself, which is what, after all, the proponents in the end actually want. Should there be a constitutional amendment requiring a balanced federal budget? Advocate Avi Nelson says yes. Yes, I think there definitely should be a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. And to help me make that case tonight, first, we will have with us Governor Jerry Brown, Democrat from California, who will be joining us from Washington. Charles Baird, a professor of economics from California State University at Hayward, and Senator Jim McClure, United States Senator, Republican from Idaho. Understand there are two points to this proposition. One is that the budget should be balanced, and the second is that it should be done by constitutional amendment. It's necessary to balance the budget because we have had over the last 20 years deficit after deficit. When the government runs up a deficit, what it does is it turns on the printing presses and in effect prints money to make up for the deficit. That cheapens the currency and imposes a tax upon all of us that hits hardest on the poor and the elderly and those on fixed income. We have to do it through a constitutional amendment process because we simply cannot count on the people in Washington, the politicians, to be responsible. We have had, unfortunately, a generation of fiscal irresponsibility there. That's how we have gotten to this mess in the first place. High taxes, high inflation, problems all over the economy. So we have to impose the constraint from above. And that's the advantage of a constitutional amendment. So we must have a balanced budget and a constitutional amendment to do it. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Advo Advocate Barney Frank says no. Thank you. Snake oil is back. Tonight, you're going to be sold a very nice, simple, but kind of vague solution to a lot of complicated problems. With me tonight to persuade you not to buy it or Congressman Henry Royce, chair of the U.S. House Committee on Banking, Finance, and Urban Affairs, and Professor Kenneth Galbraith, an economist who's a student of fiscal policy. We're not debating whether or not we ought to balance the budget. We're not debating whether the President and Congress, in the normal democratic way, ought to take that step. What we're debating is the notion that we ought to write a particular controversial economic theory into the Constitution of the United States, and by so doing, take the whole fiscal process out of the hands of the people in the normal democratic way. We're told that you can't trust the Congress. Apparently, we can't trust the American people to elect a Congress and a president and communicate their views so that fiscal policy can be made in the normal democratic way. We can't tell you exactly what the amendment will do because a lot of the proponents have been smart enough to keep it very vague. Some of them won't tell us what it says, so we can't tell you what it will do. But if it will do anything at all, Mandating that the budget has to be balanced by Constitution year in and year out means that when we run into a situation of unemployment, the federal government will be unable to respond by job-creating, stimulating measures. And as in the past, a commitment to a balanced budget imposed by a Constitution 
will cause us to go deeper into recession. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll be back to our cases and our debate in a moment. But first, a word about some of the difficult issues in tonight's debate. It's clear that we have here at least two conflicting economic philosophies. The proponents of the amendment believe that constant and increasing federal debt, the unbalanced budget, is at the root of our economic problems. The other side makes the argument first propounded by the British economist John Maynard Keynes back during the Great Depression. The deficit spending by government going into debt during slow cycles in the economy can help ease the burden on everybody during economic hard times. Now let's get on with our cases. Mr. Nelson, the floor is yours. I call Governor Jerry Brown of California. Welcome to the Advocates, Governor Brown. Nice to have you with us. Nice to be here, by telephone at least. Governor, thank you for joining us from Washington. Let me begin by asking the basic question. Do you believe in a constitutional amendment to balance the budget? Very simply, in the same way that the women of America wish to constitutionalize the commitment to sexual equality, uh, the people in this country that wish to bring fiscal responsibility and a climate that will build for the future uh, see the necessity of giving constitutional stature to a requirement to balance our federal budget. It makes eminent good sense. And I think if Mr. Lyndon Johnson had to balance the budget in the 60s, he would have gotten out of Vietnam a lot sooner. Do you think it's realistic to try to balance the budget? Some people say that uh, that's not a realistic objective. Uh, all budgets must ultimately be brought into balance. And the only question is, will this generation be so irresponsible so as to pass on to the next generation the excesses that it uh, lacks the courage to correct. I see a need for fiscal discipline. I see a need for creating a climate of investment, increasing our increases in productivity, strengthening our dollar. And one way, not the only, but a significant step forward would be to introduce a constitutional requirement, meaning that we balance what we spend uh, as against what we can collect. But, Governor, you just heard the advocate from the other side say that uh, you can't eliminate deficits. You'll eliminate a tool of management of the economy. Has deficit spending been successful? Uh, in some cases, it probably has. But the proposition today, as judged by the record of the last 20 years, is an annual budget deficit. And John Maynard Keynes said the most serious evil is the corrosive, uh, corrosive effect of inflation. And certainly the interest on our federal debt that has increased three times faster than the cost of living during this decade presents a serious challenge to the future stability and well-being of the republic. I think a balanced budget is possible. I think it can be done. And a constitutional amendment will crystallize the political will that is now lacking in the Congress to make the hard choices, whether through taxation or cutting or a combination of both, to bring into alignment in a reasonable time period our spending with our tax collections. Governor, if deficits are bad for us, why is it that they have been accepted by the public for so long, up until now? Because the aggregation of special interests have such individually appealing causes that the Congress is unable to resist them. And while an amendment of itself, uh, acting in a vacuum, would have a difficult time overcoming that special interest power. I believe that with the force of the ratification process, the national debate, and the elections over the next several years, that the chemistry in Washington will correct what has been lacking in the past, namely the ability to say no to the myriad of interest when aggregated lead to the excess, the dollar weakness, the monetizing of the deficit, and a general decline in American power that ultimately will unwind the social compact. I know the congressman would like to uh, correct this problem, but when the constituents come in and say, more money for schools, for medicine, for the military, for this, for that, they can't make the hard choice. The amendment provides the crystallization of the political will of this nation to give the Congress the fortitude that I think it wants, but uh, really requires uh, in the form of, a, of an amendment to uh, make a reality in the years ahead. All right, gentlemen, let me interrupt at this point. Governor Brown, uh, Mr. Frank is now going to ask you some questions on cross-examination. Mr. Frank. Governor, it's 
nothing we can do by amendment to undo the last 20 years. For the future now, are you in favor of some economic stimulus by the federal government in times of recession? Uh, I wouldn't be opposed to an appropriate stimulus if it could be uh, controlled, but I see right now that in the midst of an annualized rate of 15% inflation, we're still running a deficit of over $40 billion. But, but, Governor, the amendment doesn't just address itself to today. When we're amending the Constitution of the United States, we have to have a somewhat longer-range view. My question to you is, on the one hand, you've said we have to balance the budget every year and we should mandate that constitutionally. Doesn't that deprive us of the option in a recession if a majority then constituted of the people in the Congress mm -hmm. want to use a deficit to defeat unemployment in well, a particular recession? Uh, the fact is we have structural unemployment, we have huge deficits, and I believe that an amendment could be written with sufficient flexibility to allow for uh, the vagaries of the business cycle in this country. So you're for a balanced budget except when we should unbalance it. Uh, wh where is that amendment? Would you show it to us? You've been uh, for this for three, four, five months. Have you such an amendment that we can look at? Well, I will say this, that uh, you've opposed it without seeing it, so you must have the ability to make a judgment. No. Uh, That's right, Con Governor. I I've opposed it, Governor. We're I've debating opposed a matter it. of principle, and I say as a matter of principle, we ought to balance the budget, and it won't get done unless we have a national debate, an amendment, and the ratification Governor, and the election of the people in 80 and 82 and 84. Governor, what I'm opposed to, to is evasion and inconsistency. You say, on the one hand, we should balance the budget. On the other hand, you say, except if we're in a recession, we could divide one that was sufficiently flexible. I think that there's an inconsistency between a commitment annually to balancing the budget, which you first said, and a recognition that deficits are an appropriate tool. I think your failure to come up with an amendment shows that you recognize the inconsistency. If it can be overcome, why haven't you put that down on paper to show well, us? I didn't say writing the amendment was, is easy. I just said that the difficulties and risks of an amendment to the Constitution are far less than business as usual, which is progressively unwinding the social compact. And there's no magic in a balanced budget uh, in, 12, uh, in 12 days or 12 months. There can be flexibility. But Governor, we're in. talking about the amending the to Constitution. Make the commitment to do it. Gentlemen, Governor, we're not, we, gentlemen, we're not going to be able to understand like you to, if you uh, talk at question. the same time. Go ahead. Well, the like question you. is it may, you say it's not easy to write it, but you're a national leader, you're campaigning on this issue. Don't you think you have an obligation to tell the people what it is and some specifics that you're for? I have seen versions of them and I oppose them. How can you ask the American people to rally behind a crystallization which is uh, amorphous and doesn't have any substance well, in paper? Well, uh, it obviously is not so amorphous that uh, panic is set in in many quarters because of it. I think an appropriate amendment could be drafted but and you ought draft to come one. out of a careful process of national and congressional debate. Now, Governor, uh, th this amendment that you won't draft, you say that we have a problem now with the special interest. I'll be glad to draft with anything. it, and I may just Well, Governor, do please don't. I, I asked you, and you, I, I thought we'd go on to a new subject. You didn't want to talk about that one. The question is, you're talking about the special interests. Won't the special interests in a post-constitutional amendment Congress have the same power they have now? What in your amendment is going to loosen the grip of those special interests? Uh, I would say the political chemistry will be quite uh, different after 1980 if this amendment is debated and in a process of ratification, uh, those who line up against it uh, may not be around to uh, fight it, and those who are elected will have a renewed spirit to fiscal discipline but that you don't will think be required you can, in the 1980s. You can't take on the special interest without this unwritten constitutional amendment? I think that the uh, past history uh, indicates that uh, the Congress and, and this nation is in the grip uh, of a fiscal excess that requires an extraordinary remedy. And I would identify that as an appropriately drafted amendment to the Constitution. Appropriately, but as count. yet undrafted. Gentlemen, I'm sorry I have to interrupt at this point. We've run out of time. Governor Brown, thank you very much for being with us in the Advocates this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nelson, another witness, please. I call Professor Charles Baird. Welcome to the Advocates, Professor Baird. Nice to have you with us. We've heard from a political leader. Professor Baird is a professor of economics. <laughs> professor Baird, are deficits bad? Yes, they are. Why? Well, for three reasons. First, they are often the occasion for inflation. Secondly, they are almost as often the occasion for hampering of real economic growth. And thirdly, they amount to an increasing burden on future generations, which we are merely shifting forward with abandon. 
Let's take these in order. You said first they cause inflation. How do they cause inflation? Frequently, deficits are financed by simply the 20th century equivalent of printing the money up. And throughout history, the sole source, not just one source, but the sole source of any sustained inflation has been printing up of new money. So the practice has been to print money in response to deficits, and that's the cause of inflation. That is a primary cause of inflation. It's also possible to increase the money supply even without deficits, but deficits provide one important upward push mm -hmm. on that money supply. What about economic growth? How do deficits impede economic growth? Well, deficits are often, uh, as well, financed by borrowing from the private sector. Now, when financing, uh, when, when private sector borrowers uh, cannot get the money that government sector borrowers are taking, these uh, private sector borrowers who would be spending the money on plant and equipment, uh, which provides jobs, uh, of course will not be providing those jobs and thereby real economic growth will be hampered. And thirdly, you said it uh, hurts future generations. How does it hurt the future generations? Well, the national debt now is in the neighborhood of 800 billion. The interest, the yearly interest on that national debt is in the neighborhood of 50 billion. Now at some point in time, if these uh, bonds that represent the national debt are uh, honest contracts, uh, those bills are going to have to be paid. And when those bills are paid, taxpayers that exist at that point in time are going to be coerced because after all, taxes are coerced payments. They're going to be coerced at that point in time to then pay for the spending that we participated in today. Now, Professor Baird, we've heard the theory enunciated a number of times that it's necessary to have deficits in order to spur the economy, especially at times of recession. <coughs> this is part of the so-called Keynesian theory. Yes. Do you agree with that? Is that correct? No, I do not agree with that. Deficits by themselves, that is, deficits that are not accompanied by increases of the money supply, cannot have any effect, cannot have any effect on total spending. What they do is merely reallocate the spending government spends more and the private sector spends less. Because after all, the deficits are, in the absence of creating money, the deficits are financed by merely going to the private sector and borrowing the money. And when you take money out of the private sector from borrowing, that's exactly like taking money out of the private sector by taxing. The private sector ends up spending less, the government sector ends up spending more. In terms of total spending, it's a wash. Gentlemen, let me interrupt at this point. Mr. Nelson, you're going to have an opportunity to ask Professor Beard a few more questions. But now we go to Mr. Frank for cross-examination. Professor Baird, so I understand, unlike Governor Brown, you are not in favor of deficits as a form of stimulus in times of economic recession. I think they're useless for that purpose. So in supporting this amendment, you're willing to write this into the Constitution as a requirement because you want to rule out reference to deficits in times of uh, recession. That is right. So you're not looking for an amendment that's flexible, that's balanced most of the time. That's right. Now, let me ask you, uh, if we did have such a, uh, a uh, situation, what do you think uh, would get cut? What would, what would you think uh, Congress ought to do? I assume you're not for raising taxes. That's exactly right, so too. What we want to do then <laughs> is, is to reduce spending. Would you tell us uh, what spending you would reduce? Yes, right at the top, I would abolish the Department of Energy. It hasn't done anything useful except create energy shortages. Right. <laughs> Next, I would abolish all agricultural price support programs. All that does is make food more expensive so for, instance, for like poor people. The prices of sugar, would you want to cut down the price of sugar? I would want the price of sugar, as the price of anything else, to be determined right. by the voluntary choices of people in the market. Thank you. The Senator of Idaho might want to talk about that later. The, uh, the question then is, uh, you've given us what you think ought to be cut. You've told us what you think ought to be cut. You, you, you want to balance the budget so we don't have any deficits in times of inflation, and we do away with agricultural price supports, we do away with the Department of Energy. How likely are the cuts that you advocate to be the cuts that this Congress sits in the grips of the special interest? What, what are they likely to do, this Congress? Well, it's hard for me to guess on what the Congress is going to do. I'm better at uh, suggesting what I would like them to do. I have no well, way of knowing what they're going the, to do. With all respect, Professor, we cannot amend the Constitution based on what you would like to do. Uh, we have to amend the Constitution assuming that we know what Congress will do. But the amendment does not, uh, the amendment that I'm advocating is not going to include in it those uh, expenditure categories that should be cut. It is merely going to say that the budget must be balanced. Now we pay congressmen presumably to do something. 
And maybe what they ought to do is consider carefully what ought to be oh, but, but cut. Professor, and I'd be willing to testify in favor of cutting those things when the time arises. But, Professor, of course it doesn't say what you want cut. That's one of the problems. The amendment isn't quite as explicit. But you and I understand that cuts will have to come. Yes. Now, on the one hand, you see, I'm confused. On the one hand, we're told that Congress could balance the budget uh, by, b today. Why do we need an amendment? You tell us we need an amendment because you can't trust Congress. They're in the grips of the special interest. When I ask you then what's likely to happen, you now conjure up a rational Congress that's going to do this well. You can't have it both ways. If Congress is in the grips of the special interest and we must amend it, what gives you any confidence that the Congress that makes the cuts won't just wreak havoc with the poor and the vulnerable? Very good question, and I've got a good answer. <laughs> If it is indeed the case that every time a dollar is spent, a dollar has to be, ra be raised in taxes, then the taxpayers are going to have a very keen incentive to, to mount as active an anti-spending lobbying campaign as the special interests do right now. What happened in California, uh, what's happening now in California with regard to Proposition 13? Are the right cuts being made in, in Governor Brown's state? Is his chemistry set working out there? <laughs> Um, uh, my choices of uh, what should happen in California is somewhat different from what is happening, but what is happening isn't all that bad. Well, but you told the California Ways and Means Committee of the Assembly in February that, uh, uh, that, that the wrong things were happening. Maybe things have gotten better since then, but you said it was the, the genuinely disabled, the retarded and the crippled who were being threatened by these cuts. Are there any reason to assume that the Congress of the United States is morally superior to the California legislature? Very short answer. Uh, no reason Very at short all. answer. Thank Gentlemen, you. <laughs> don't go away. Professor Baird, Mr. Nelson has a question or two for you. Baird, uh, the point was made that you're in favor of a constitutional amendment where there would be no escape clause, as it's called. There is no way with the, that the Congress could have a deficit. Would you say that a, uh, an amendment that had such an escape clause is preferable to none at all? Absolutely. And in terms of the... Uh, the question of spending with regard to the congressman, uh, isn't it true that one of the reasons that there is this kind of spending pattern is that they have an incentive to try to hide some of the costs and the deficit because they can then vote for programs but not have to allocate the taxes? That's been the mechanism for increasing expenditure since the end of World War II. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Baird, for being with us. Appreciate it. All right, let's turn now to Mr. Frank, who has his first witness. Mr. Frank. Thank you, Mike. Mr. Caucus, I've called Congressman Henry Royce. <laughs> Welcome to the Advocates again. Congressman Royce, nice to have you with us. Congressman Royce is uh, Chairman of the Committee on Banking, Finance, and Urban Affairs. Presumably you have some familiarity with these things. Is Congress irresponsible? <laughs> it has been, but this amendment certainly isn't going to make it responsible. It might make it responsible for making a depression out of a recession, because if this amendment passes and the Arabs raise their oil price or something else goes wrong in the world and uh, there's more unemployment and a larger deficit, then under this amendment, uh, Congress would either have to raise taxes or reduce expenditures or both, and that would simply intensify the recession into a depression make the deficit worse, and we'd be chasing our tail around forever. Well, Congressman, Governor Brown told us quite confidently that he was sure an amendment could be drafted by this Congress that uh, he has no confidence in. Um, do you think uh, it would be possible, and he said, and we've just to been told by Mr. Nelson, an escape clause would be okay for, for people who have a lingering fondness for some government action against unemployment. Uh, would you say that if we required a two-thirds vote of the Congress, to deal with recession, that that would be an effective escape clause? No, because uh, you can't get two-thirds of the Congress to do much of anything. Look at the <laughs> look at the attempts of the proponents of this amendment to get a two-thirds vote. So Very difficult to you do. You think the practical effect of an amendment would be to rule out any reliance on deficits to fight inflation in, in, in bad mm -hmm. economic times? Well, I don't, I don't put great store by deficits to fight inflation. I don't like deficits very much, but sometimes uh, you get deficits when you don't want them. And then to be forced to balance the budget would make a major depression. And I don't think that's a very good idea. Well, now, we've also heard the governor, a governor of a state, talk about the irresponsibility of the Congress, that the debt of the Congress is uh, $800 billion. Is, is that the situation, that the congressional debt is getting so out of hand that the states are going to have to stop, uh, step in and protect the people from you big spenders? Uh, uh, at the, since World War II, the national debt has gone up 
uh, three times. That's bad. But state local debt has gone up more than 15 times. So if there ought to be a constitutional amendment, it would be to balance the state budgets. But of course, I'm not advocating that because that too would be an abuse of the Constitution. Well, let's talk about the question of the Constitution. Are, are you against uh, balanced budgets as a concept? Is that why you're up here? No, I think that our goal ought to be full employment and a balanced budget year in and year out. I think that would be an excellent economic solution. But I don't want to see that in our Constitution any, mo any more than I would like to see a 55 mile per hour speed limit, though that's a good thing, in our Constitution or, for that matter, one of Governor Brown's uh, great ideas, which I think is an excellent one, that small is beautiful. Uh, so far as I know, Governor Brown hasn't advocated it, that we put that in the Constitution, <laughs> at least as yet. Well, what about this notion that uh, if we have a constitutional amendment, by some process of chemistry, we'll break the grip of the special interests on Congress? No, the special interests you have with you always, and you aren't going to be able to get rid of them. The, Russet potato people and the sugar people are going to be after my friend Senator McClure. The dairy people are going to be after me, and uh, we'll have to do the best we can. So if Congress it. were forced to make drastic cuts uh, right now, who would it cut? Who would get hurt? A brief answer, please, Congressman. Uh, the, the, the poor, those who need it, they, they're always the ones without much of a lobby. Right, gentlemen, let's turn to Mr. Nelson now. who has some questions for you, Congressman. <clears throat> well, Congressman, in terms of the two-thirds, uh, isn't it true that... Uh, Veto overrides require two-thirds. Treaty ratifications require two-thirds. Those happen all the time. Uh, veto overrides? Uh, very rare. Very rare. Very oh. difficult to get two-thirds. Oh, they, they certainly would not be called an unusual yeah. occurrence. Yeah. And of course, name, the Panama, name, name three. The Panama Canal Treaty has, has of course, gotten two-thirds of the vote. So, I mean, it is possible well, name, that, some, name some veto overrides. Well, but, but my point is that, that clearly I would like to be able to. Very difficult to get two-thirds. I would like to be able to name you a few more than it ha has happened. But the fact is, of course, that it does happen. And a two-thirds process as a process is something that we have in the Congress on a, a daily basis. Yes, so, that, that was what the founding fathers thought of as an almost insurmountable obstacle, two-thirds. They were right. But it is in the process. And I would hate to put that insurmountable obstacle in the way of our getting rid of a depression in this country. You mentioned that the, you expect that the poor would be hurt by a, uh, a balanced budget. And uh, that's curious to me. Are you saying that the Congress would be so irresponsible that if there were a balanced budget, they would cut out worthwhile social programs and maintain the special interest programs? Yes. No, I didn't say anything about the poor being hurt under a balanced budget. I said that the poor would be hurt by spending cuts. And it, it, it is true that the poor aren't represented by million-dollar lobbies in Washington. It's the, it's the big interests who are, and they would usually escape a cut. I think what I'm driving at is if there were a constitutionally mandated balanced budget, there was discussion before that there would have to be some budget cuts made. And I would like to think that the Congress faced with this new responsibility, would recognize that those programs that are not worthwhile would be eliminated and the valuable programs, social and otherwise, would be maintained. Is, would yeah, you... uh, uh, yes, but where you and I disagree is I think that Congress ought to cut out the nonsense whether or not there is a balanced budget or a balanced budget amendment. And I'd hate to see us wait on that until we get an amendment on the books. I think we ought to be about that right now. I would agree with that, but uh, I know that some of the items that are passed by the Congress certainly fall into the nonsense category, and that is being done now. For example, uh, $102,000 to study the behavior of fish while drunk. Uh, <laughs> this is the kind of program that gets by now, so obviously the need for budgetary control has not permeated the halls of the Congress. In fact, in the last two years, Congress has put into place a very good process called the budget process under which if I want to vote for a appropriation which is going to pierce the budgetary ceiling which we've adopted, I have to find the money for that by cutting someplace else and convincing Congress it ought to be cut. So we have crocheted ourselves a hair shirt which is really working. Uh, I don't know about the hair shirt, but I do know that the Council on Wage and Price Stability just had a 500% increase in personnel and a 300% increase in budget. 
It doesn't sound like biting the bullet. In well, it, it all depends what you uh, and this is wage what and your, price what your base is. The uh, the Council on Wage uh, and Wages and Prices uh, was given about 200 additional employees, but since their job is to ride herd on price increases throughout the nation, I don't think it's excessive to have somebody able to answer the phone when a businessman calls up and says, uh, am I justified in increasing my price? And Congressman, you pledged your commitment to balanced budgets as a theory, but didn't you vote four times last year and twice this year against a balanced budget, including one where the President wanted to cut nearly a billion dollars? The House was going to make it a $703 million cut. You were not in favor of either of those. Well, I, I, I don't want to sail under false colors here. I don't think this year or last year this country can have a balanced budget because to do so would require our raising taxes to an amount that would plunge us into a depression. So uh, I, will plead, uh, I will plead guilty, as must every Democrat and Republican in Congress, to having voted for a total budget that ended up in deficit. The important thing We've had one is that we're years. now moving to cut that deficit in two. This year, it's going to be half of what it was last year, and that's a good thing. Gentlemen, but I it's have still to, a deficit. I'm sorry I have to interrupt at this point. Mr. Frank, a few additional questions for Congressman Rice. Thank you. Congressman, uh, Governor Brown, you guys know, also was opposed to balancing the budget this year. He wants to phase it in. I want to ask you, though, he suggested that if we had a balanced budget amendment, that would have ended the Vietnam War. You were there at the time. Do you think that's accurate? No, I think LBJ had that bit in his teeth and that uh, you could have had any number of laws on the books and it, it, it wouldn't have stopped the war. Well, let's talk about defense spending. Uh, we spend a lot of money on defense. It's the only part of the budget that, of substantial part, that grew this year. Would I be safe to assume that the balanced budget people are also the people who are most interested in cutting that defense budget so we can bring federal spending under control? No, typically the balanced budgeter wants to uh, enlarge the, the military budget and uh, uh, cut down on Social Security for the old folks or school lunches for the kids or whatever. I, it needn't always be that way, but that's but, typically but the, the way it the works. But the advocates out. of the balanced budget are people who would have the military be a much, much larger percentage of the total federal expenditure, I would assume, than we now have it. And when you make increases there, you're added deficit is huge. It isn't just a hundred thousand dollars. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Congressman, very, very much for being here. For those of you who may have, may have joined us late, we're debating the question, should there be a constitutional amendment requiring a balanced federal budget? Mr. Nelson has presented two witnesses in favor of that proposal, Governor Jerry Brown of California and Professor Chuck Baird of uh, California State University. They have argued very strongly that we need such an amendment, that Congress simply cannot be trusted or expected to get spending in line with revenues, and that unless we have such an amendment, we will be, in effect, mortgaging our present to the future. On the other hand, Mr. Frank has presented his first witness, Congressman Royce, who has argued that if such an amendment goes through, it would be virtually impossible for this country to combat recession, depression, and unemployment. Now let's turn to Mr. Frank, who has a second witness. Mr. Thank Frank. you, Mr. Caucus. I call John Kenneth Galbraith. <laughs> nice to have you back in the Advocates again, Professor Galbraith. Professor Galbraith, our opponents would have us uh, believe we're debating inflation. Where do you stand on inflation, for it or against it? Oh, I'm, <clears throat> I consider inflation a very damaging thing, and I've devoted a very large part of my life, almost as much as Congressman Royce, to opposing it, but by effective rather than by theological means. Well, <laughs> uh, do I denote a, do I detect a note of skepticism that the present <laughs> that the present enormous deficit is the single or major cause of all our inflation? Well, <clears throat> I've been, I must say, astonished at the almost uh, catastrophic neglect of figures here this evening. They, uh, at the present time, the federal government, uh, as you as a state legislator know, sends about $80 billion out to the states in state aid. So one has to look both at the federal budget and at the state budget together. And if one looks at those budgets together for fiscal 1980, 
there is a deficit of uh, something under two billions, 1.9 billion. So that uh, the notion that has been circulated here that we're talking in terms of large deficits is, uh, is also part of the uh, fantasy of my learned colleagues. Oh, I don't want to be hard on them. P Professor, you, <laughs> you may puzzle some of our audience. Here you are, you're against inflation and you're not for uh, deficits uh, all over the lot. Why then do you resist uh, this, this wonderful, albeit unwritten, constitutional amendment? Well, as I say, the, the, the problem of inflation is a complex thing, which includes uh, control, of, and it's control, it controls control of bank lending, monetary policy. Con it includes the budget. And there are times, and I think this is a time, when one doesn't, and so far from wanting a deficit, one would want a very substantial surplus in our combined budgets. But then also the problem of inflation includes uh, wages. We haven't uh, mentioned the Teamsters here tonight. Uh, and it also includes corporate prices. It also includes agricultural prices. It even, Senator, I think includes sugar prices. Uh, so that uh, to, uh, to select out uh, a budget that is almost in balance and say that is the cause of inflation is, if I must say so, an insult to this audience. Well, but Professor, you then, uh, I have to ask you, why are you opposed though, to a constitutional amendment which would require a balance if we now, if you think we ought to have one now? Well, because the, um, as uh, Congressman Roy said, and said very well, um, if we are, uh, if we have a depression or a recession, if there's a great deal of unemployment, then uh, to, at that time to seek to balance the budget will not only add to the suffering of the unemployed, but it is self-defeating because the effort to increase taxes or cut expenditures lowers income in the economy as a whole, lowers tax returns, and makes the deficit worse. Well, Professor, you have uh, been around watching these things longer than some of us. I just wonder whether... Uh this talk about balancing the budget at all costs and keeping it balanced uh, makes you nostalgic at all for a, uh, for a different time. Yes. There is, well, we're, we're living in a time of nostalgia, and I must say here is where I compliment my colleagues. Uh, they have shown a certain amount of imagination in picking out Herbert Hoover as the subject of their, as the imagery of their uh, nostalgic association. It was Herbert Hoover who struggled in the early 1930s to balance the budget, uh, in doing so, uh, intensified the depths of the depression, uh, increased the unemployment, and it is now, I think, part of the romantic nostalgia of our time uh, that uh, we seek to get back to Herbert Hoover. Well, now there's imagination there, but perhaps not substance. So you're saying that a constitutional amendment which required the budget to be balanced all the time, as Mr. Baird would have it, or some unspecified times as Governor Brown would have it, or when two-thirds overrode, uh, unless two-thirds overrode, as Mr. Nelson would have it, that uh, the combined effect of any or all of those amendments would have a negative effect at some future time in our economy? Yes, if observed. <clears throat> but you will notice that our colleagues here this evening, uh, when faced with it, uh, are uh, defend not the balanced budget, but the escape clauses, uh, which shows the lack of conviction, which I'm sure that Congressman Royce and I will not at any being on the right side of this issue will not be thought guilty of displaying. Well, then, Professor, what would you say to a uh, balanced budget amendment which, in eloquent terms, crystallized the public will, as Governor Brown would have us, but uh, was all full of escape clauses? Would you have any particular objection to that exhortation in the Constitution? Yes, I would. Well, I would very much dislike to uh, see the, uh, the waste of time that would be involved in bringing together a constitutional convention. Governor, I'm not getting over on that subject. Uh, and uh, which would uh, then affirm uh, what Congressman Royce and you, uh, what we are arguing tonight, which is that ultimately the responsibility must lie with the Congress. And Gentlemen, I have to interrupt. I'm sorry, Mr. Frank. Let's uh, go over to Mr. Nelson now, Professor Galbraith, yes. for a few questions. Now, Professor, you, uh, you said that you're in favor of a balanced budget at this point in time. I, no, no, I didn't. I said I think that we should have a surplus at the present Sur time. Surplus. I, I would point out that Congressman Royce voted against even a balance for this year. There is, uh, there's room for difference of opinion for people who are opposed to this amendment. Yes, indeed. Uh, we don't differ on that. Uh, don't make anything of that. Okay. 
I will let the, the disarray in the ranks on the other side be disarray. Professor, would you, if I would agree... No, this isn't disarray. Uh, <laughs> Roy, Royce and I are solidly opposed to, uh, uh, to this nonsense of a, con of a uh, constitutional convention to uh, have a balanced budget. There's no, di no difference between us. There is that. disagreement as to whether there should be a surplus now or not. Oh, there's certainly, and we, I'm not sure we disagree on a lot of Let me go on, so. if I might. Mm -hmm. uh, I would agree that deficits aren't always bad. Would you agree that they are sometimes bad? Uh, that deficits, that deficits are, some are sometimes bad. Absolutely. No question about that. Over the past 20 years, we've had a single year where there was not a deficit. Would you have agreed with that policy? No, I think we should. There, there have been times in the past when I would have, when I did strongly urge a, uh, uh, a stronger fiscal policy. I was uh, <clears throat> one of the few economists at uh, uh, President Ford's summit meetings who argued very strongly at that time for a tax increase uh, when he called uh, together the great men of the country to uh, decide what should be done against inflation. <laughs> so apparently the Keynesian theology has either not been followed very well or has been followed no, no, no. Keynes, right to this problem. Keynes was, a, Keynes was a very great man and he would, uh, under those circumstances, have strongly urged uh, a surplus. I see there's nostalgia on the other side as well. No, no. <laughs> uh, I, th I think you're right. There's, uh, I suppose there is a difference between nostalgia for uh, wisdom and nostalgia for error. Uh -huh. <laughs> the only question then is who's to, who's to judge which is which. Uh, yes, Let sir. me go back uh, to the Congress. You would agree, then, that the Congress has not acted responsibly uh, over the course of the past 20 years, or there have been periods of time when, times when they have Oh, acted. I think the Congress has been much more responsible in the last 20 years than it was during the Great Depression. Uh, there's no question about that. But in my lifetime, I think it's fair to say, in the presence of two distinguished members of the Congress, that there's no body, uh, not even the Harvard undergraduate body, that has so improved uh, in one <laughs> lifetime. As the, as the Congress of the United States. Now, it isn't perfect, but it is... Uh, I, I notice but, you... I'm sorry. And... Uh, I notice and you mentioned I, the Harvard undergraduate body, not the faculty. And I... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I would have... I'm, I'm seeking to avoid ad hominem argument here. Uh, I, I sense possibly that your two defeats for Congress may be uh, leading you to wish that you could get to Washington by way of a constitutional convention. Is that possible? <laughs> Gentlemen, this is all very pleasant. Can we get back to the question? <laughs> <laughs> Professor, if you are if you're convinced that the Congress is by and large responsible... I, I, take, then, I, I, then, I withdraw that last comment if you withdraw your attack on the Harvard faculty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was a compliment, not an attack. A balanced uh, budget, gentlemen. That's what we're discussing. <laughs> wouldn't you say that the Congress should be responsible enough to know where to make cuts or when to increase taxes if indeed there were a constitutional amendment that required a balanced budget? I think probably the, Con the Congress would be very much like the Congress we have now. Uh, it, uh, the excitement uh, over uh, this discussion uh, might bring a few extremists into the Congress, but I don't really think that's too dangerous. Isn't it also true that part of the problem here is not economics so much as it is that it gives the congressmen an opportunity to hide some of the costs of their programs? And, in effect, that they want to provide programs for their constituents, they don't want to pay for them, and therefore, by having a deficit, they can accomplish to some extent both. It's part of the name of the game. I think this is unquestionably true. No one who knows the Congress can doubt that this is true, but... Uh, Shouldn't we try to change that? If uh, I think this would be no less true if a two-thirds or three-quarter majority were required in line with Governor Brown's suggestion to pass a... Uh, uh, an appropriations bill. I don't think it would be altering that at all. Do you? I do, because I think mm -hmm. the constitutional mandate would tell the Congress that they'd have to be more explicit in terms of the, the, the delineation of the cost of the program. And if nothing else, two-thirds would make it more difficult for them to hide the costs. Gentlemen, I don't know who's asking the questions and who's giving the answers, but I have to interrupt at this point. Professor Galbraith, thank you very much for being with us. Nelson, I never knew 
that Idaho and sugar were associated, but I have a feeling we're going to hear about that the we're next few minutes. We're going to find out. Your next I witness, call please. Senator James McClure. Welcome to the Advocate Center. Thank McClure. you. Nice to have you with us. Jim McClure is a Republican senator from the great state of Idaho, and uh, I will leave to my advocate on the other side the questions about sugar and potatoes and the like and deal with the more substantive questions what do you think the solution is to the current economic problems that we have? Well, there can be no doubt about the solution. First of all, we must find a way to limit the growth of government and limit the cost of government by, in my judgment, a balanced budget amendment, a limit on federal spending, and a reversal of our tax system, a system that ought to reward those who invest and produce and save rather than rewarding those who consume. I think that's a very clear mandate, and I hope that we'll get about doing it. Senator, has deficit spending worked in our economy? Of course it hasn't worked. If you want to look at what it's produced, look at the $800 billion national debt, look at the $60 billion in annual interest on that debt, $50 billion, which is, not for, uh, is real payments from taxpayers. Uh, look at the high rates of unemployment, the high interest rates, the stagnation in our economy today, the growth rates, which are much less than other countries. And I think you obviously see the end result of the economic planning and fine-tuning that some experts would have us do. And has it caused inflation? Of course it's caused inflation. It's not the sole cause of inflation, uh, but it certainly contributes. Uh, the deficit spending crowds out private investment, it creates an inflationary psychology, and it leads to the printing of additional money, which certainly inflates. You dare to con contradict <laughs> Professor Galbraith, I take it? Of course. I, it's just too bad that He's living in past decades and can't modernize his thinking. <clears throat> do we have to do this in the form of an amendment? Uh, as it's been suggested that, well, maybe it's a good idea, but not as an amendment. Well, I've been in the Congress for 12 years now, six years in the House and six years in the Senate. And I'd have to say that the Congress is not going to balance the budget unless it's forced to do it. It's had a number of opportunities to do it, but it has missed every opportunity, resolutely pushed them into the background, and even with an annualized rate of inflation running at 15 percent today, Congressman Royce can say he is opposed to balancing the budget this year. Sometime, maybe, but not this year. Senator, are you troubled by the, that it might be inappropriate or that the amendment is vague or hasn't been drafted yet? Well, certainly uh, there are a number of amendments that have been drafted, that have been introduced, that are before the public and the, before the Congress for discussion. That doesn't disturb me that, as a matter of fact, Congress might have to take a look at it and change some of the language if indeed they judge that wise to do. We'll have the advice of a lot of people as to how to do that, I'm sure. If we had a constitutional amendment for a balanced budget, would it, it indeed, as has been alleged, hurt the minorities and the poor? Uh, the greatest danger to the minorities and the poor is continued inflation, continued economic stagnation that does not allow them to grow. They've got to have an expanding, growing economy if they're going to participate in it. The greatest danger to the minorities and the poor is that we'll continue to have deficits that are supposed to rescue them, but actually mire them further in the lack of opportunity. It has been said that a number of people did not give up slavery of one kind to be subjected to the slavery of the federal handout. What about times of war or recession? A very brief answer, please. Uh, time of war may be a, a different uh, question. In recession, I'm not at all certain that deficit spending gets us out of it. We tried that. That's been kind of dogma for 40 years. But you, we found out you can't spend yourself rich. You can't do it. I can't do it. The government can't do it. Thank you, Senator. All right. Let's turn to Mr. Frank. Some questions. Mm -hmm. Frank. Mm -hmm. Senator, uh, mm -hmm. I gather that, again, mm -hmm. unlike Governor Brown, you don't think that we should have mm -hmm. deficit spending in time of recession. So drafting an amendment, I realize, isn't a problem for you. But I do want to talk about uh, the governor's notion that chemistry will accompany this mm -hmm. amendment and the special interest will dissolve. Uh, let's talk about sugar prices. You're a senator from Idaho, and you've been for higher sugar prices, for legislation to keep sugar prices higher than the market force. Will the governor's chemistry make you and higher sugar prices go away? Not at all, but you divert your attention away from the real issue about why the Congress votes deficits the way they no, do. No, the governor's chemistry. The governor may well, not, one, uh, the governor, the me, governor Senator, may be talking about chemistry. I'm not. I'm well, talking about your the Congress. But I, but I thought one of the reasons, I, if, if you want to say the governor was wrong, okay, but I, one of the reasons I thought he gave hmm. was that the amendment process itself would be purgative of the special interest and that, that we wouldn't have people fixing sugar prices or 
Uh, but you say that's wrong and, and you're not to be charged with it. So we'll, we'll forget uh, about As a matter of fact, what, what I suggest the amendment will do is make it more difficult for the special interests to induce the Congress to fund their special interests. Well, what about uh, you say that it's very important to cut mm. spending right now? Defense, the, the Pentagon budget mm. has gone up the biggest. Are you opposed no, to No, that's that? not true. Well, it's gone up pretty big. I'll withdraw biggest. Oh, went up 10 percent. Because uh, you, made you, not opposed? you made that statement well ago. Well, I, I think the record ought to be made. I, 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 the, if I made it twice, I'll withdraw it twice. Right. There was a 10 percent increase. But I, I, I suspect you don't want to talk about it, and, and I'd like to get to that. No. The question is, are you, in your feeling that it's urgent mm -hmm. and very important to balance the budget now, opposed to the 10 percent increase, uh, a more than inf inflationary increase, for the Pentagon this year? Well, first of all, the defense spending has only gone up 3 percent in this proposed budget in real terms, and defense sp and spending for social programs has gone up 12.5 percent. Well, so where is the priority in this budget? Well, I'm Let's asking you where your priority. Let's Mine get... is for the social programs, but well, I'm not that's supposed all to answer right. the questions. We'll, we'll debate that when it comes well, to the Congress. Well, but are you for reducing defense spending at all? Would you allow, allow me to answer the question? Y yes, if you'll answer well, it. Thank you. I'll try, if you'll allow me. The, the question of which spending will be cut and which will be increased will be the composite of 535 different opinions. My opinion may be one, but the fact that we have not been able to come to grips with that in the current political context tells me we've got to change it. No, but I think, Senator, that's part of the problem of the evasion. That's why I ask you the question. You're asking people to accept an amendment which will require cuts. But people, I think, have a right then to know where the cuts are going to come from. Isn't that a fair question for them the, to ask? The cuts will come from the collective judgment of a majority so of the will, Congress. So we can't know. We're being told that we should accept an amendment which mm. makes substantial cuts, but we don't know where they'll mm. come. I think that's probably correct, because if the question is whether or not you want to know with precision where they'll cut or whether you want to have right. a balanced budget. Senator, what about the injection of the judiciary mm. into the spending process? If we amend the Constitution uh, and we require a balanced budget and the budget is out of balance, what about the role of the Supreme Court and the federal courts into the uh, budget process? Don't they have to then come in and begin to enforce that and tell Congress stop spending, cut the appropriation, withhold that? Well, it's possible, I suppose, but I suspect that budget deficit is going to be whatever the Congress says it is. Uh, the I, balance or I, the I, lack of balance will be whatever the Congress says it is, just as it is now. You mean I the don't amendment think, won't mean anything? I don't think the amendment... Wait a minute, I, is this an Alice in Wonderland no, amendment? No, no, You're no, just going to redefine let, it? Uh, let's let Senator McClure answer Thank the you. question. The, um, I have never contended that the amendment is a panacea, that it will solve all the problems by itself, but it l raises the threshold by which the decisions made by Congress so easily now to satisfy special interests will be defeated. But as I understand, what you're telling me is that you want an amendment, but the courts won't get in. It's an amendment that will say there will have to be a balance, but whatever Congress says is a balance will be a balance. I said, so. Of course. The well, what have you changed then, the except city, some semantics? Yeah. Mr. Frank, no, you we have time for one last answer. The Senator very McCoy. essential thing, and that is that it makes it more difficult for the Congress to unbalance the budget. Simply make you define it differently. That's all is what you're telling no. me. Well, it isn't simply defining it differently. It requires a two-thirds vote in order to do that. Oh, you did. That is not unattainable. Gentlemen, I'm sorry I have to interrupt at this point, Senator McClure. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm sorry we can't continue this, but we'd better go to our closing arguments. One minute, Mr. Nelson, for your close. Thank you. So we're told what we heard before, that everything's okay, don't intrude on the congressional process, trust the congressional politicians, and it'll all work out in the end. The fact is, for 19 of the past 20 years, we have had deficits. And it's commonplace now to have 30, 40, 50 billion dollars a year as an annual deficit. And that's where the problem comes in, because these deficits do cause inflation, and inflation is something that impinges on all of us and hardest on those who are least able to afford it. So we need the constitutional mandate from above in order to apply this restraint. It won't hamstring the economy, and most people in favor of the amendment are indeed in favor of some kind of escape clause, if you will, so that two-thirds or three-quarters of the Congress could, under appropriate circumstances, make the changes. But as you've heard, it would at least make it more difficult for the Congress to play, pay, play political games and to, in effect, pay no heed to the people who want a balanced budget. And by the way, if you find yourself in agreement, you're not in the minority. Over 83 percent of the American people are in favor of a balanced budget, and I think we should have a constitutional amendment to have it. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Frank, you have one minute. We began with a governor who wouldn't tell us what his amendment was going to say, we ended with a senator who said, don't worry, because whatever it says, it doesn't mean anything. The deficit will be whatever we say it is. 
Well, the fact is that there is a flaw in saying that the way to deal with this is from above, as Mr. Nelson has said. You don't solve problems in a democratic society by impositions from above. Yes, we have a problem with inflation. Yes, we have a problem with special interests that are too deeply entrenched in the legislative process. But you don't stop them from some imposition from above. And you don't stop them with vaguely worded constitutional amendments that aren't intended, apparently, to mean anything. The only way you deal with those structural problems, with those inflationary tendencies, with those special interests, is by hard political work. You do that not from above, but by working in the electoral process. And to pretend that all of these problems of structural and other inflationary causes, of special interest domination of the legislative process, that they're going to go away by some chemistry because we'll crystallize the popular will behind an amendment, the wording of which we don't know, the meaning of which is unclear, it's simply to fool people, and we'll be worse off than before if people's attention is diverted to this shimmer. Right. Thank you, gentlemen, both very much. Now's the time when we hope we'll hear from you and our viewing audience. What do you think? How do you feel about this issue? Should there be a constitutional amendment to require a balanced federal budget? Send us your yes or no answer with your comments on a postcard to the Advocates, Box 1979, Boston 02134. Next week, the Advocates will debate a question that I'm sure most of you in our audience have given a lot of thought to. And that is the question of how we pay for public television and whether or not the federal government, and specifically the taxpayers of the United States, ought to pay a substantially greater share out of tax dollars for the cost of public television. And so our question next week will be, should Congress approve greatly increased federal funds for public broadcasting? We hope very much that you will join us, and we hope you've enjoyed tonight's very lively debate. Our thanks to Mr. Nelson, Mr. Frank, to some very distinguished and able witnesses into the Harvard School of Government, the Kennedy School of Government here at Harvard, our host this evening. Thank you, and good night. If you would like a written copy of tonight's debate, send $2 to Transcript, Post Office Box 1979, Boston 02134. by WGBH-TV, which is solely responsible for its content and was made possible by grants from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation and Merrill Lynch Pierce Fenner & Smith, Incorporated. The Advocates is produced with the cooperation of the Institute of Politics of the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University.